Hello guys and welcome to the channel, great to have you along. So today I'm going to be talking about the Fuji X-T2 and whether I think it's still a good camera heading into 2020. So if you're new to the channel, let me just quickly explain what we do. Uh, basically this channel is all about landscape photography but my job is wedding and portrait photography and I use the Fuji X-T2s for that as well. So currently the X-T2s have done three wedding seasons so they've shot thousands and thousands of photographs and they've been out in all conditions as well for the vlog so ice, snow, wind and rain, you name it, you know these cameras have been put through their paces so yeah I thought I'd give you my sort of thoughts over the last th three years just tell you what I think about it and see you know whether it's worth upgrading them for the coming year for the coming wedding season so yeah stick with me guys So one of the reasons I bought the X-T2 in the first place uh, was because of the size and weight. Now, I was shooting with Nikons at the time, full frame Nikon cameras, and I was using two, and they're very heavy compared to the X-T2. The X-T2 is extremely light, it's around about 500 grams, give or take. But just to put this in perspective, um, the new Panasonic S1 is twice as heavy as a Fuji X-T2, so yeah, the body is twice the weight. Now, I'm sure the Panasonic's a fantastic camera, don't get me wrong, I don't know, there's nothing against the, the Panasonic S1, I think it looks like a fantastic camera, but yeah, you can get basically two X-T2s for the same weight as an S1, so, you know, for me personally, like when I'm shooting weddings, I'm, I'm carrying three bodies normally, sometimes I'm hybrid shooting, so I'm doing video and stills, so I'll use two uh, cameras for stills and one for video so yeah I've got a lot going on and, and when I'm shooting the vlog as well obviously I'm carrying two cameras as well I've got the X-T3 which I'm filming on now and then I'm using my X-T2s for shooting the landscapes with so I'm always carrying two bodies so it's really important for me to be able to keep the weight down and uh, obviously when I'm out about hiking and also wild camping as well keeping that weight to a bare minimum is really good so it's definitely a massive plus for this camera and uh, yeah something that I've really enjoyed actually just having this lightweight form factor Another thing as well is the, the look and feel of these. I mean, these cameras just make you want to pick them up. Every time I look at them, I just they just look amazing. They really do. You know, all, the ergonomics are great. You know, they fit in your hand well. Um, you know, the, the top dials, the knurled top dials. You've got all your settings there. You can see all your settings. And I absolutely love that. Um, I really do. I think the shutter button sounds amazing as well. <laughs> just it's the little bits like that that just make you want to reach out and grab the camera. Now, you know, we often hear that gear doesn't matter, but if a piece of gear inspires you to go out and shoot, then it, it certainly does matter. And I think that's the case with these. Every time I look at one, I just want to pick it up. I want to have it in my hand. Um, I've never really felt that way about any other camera. So, uh, and I've had a lot of cameras, you know, over the years. So I think that's a big plus point, I think, as well. So a few things to point out. Obviously, it's, it's a smaller camera. It's an APS-C size sensor. So the sensor is smaller compared to a full frame camera. And I, I often hear like, oh, full frame's better. That's where you'll eventually end up. But I actually came from a full frame camera. Um, all of my professional gear for years and years and years were full frame Nikon cameras. And I actually came from them to the APS-C camera. Now, I think what's worth mentioning is, you know, all sensors are different. I quite often hear that, you know, APS-C compared to a full frame sensor. Well, all of the sensors are different, you know. Uh, an entry level APS-C size sensor is not going to be as good as a sensor in a flagship X-T3 or something like that. So, you know, all the sensors are different. You can't really compare just APS-C with full frame. Uh, it's the same for a full frame camera, you know, like they do entry level full frame uh, cameras and they do, you know, top of the range full frame cameras. You know, the sensor is going to be very different, you know, uh, the quality of the sensor is going to be different. So you can't really compare just APS-C with a full frame. It just doesn't stack up. I think another thing to mention as well is glass. And I think that's maybe in the past people have associated 
uh, full frame cameras with having you know a wealth of quality glass and APS-C cameras just didn't have the quality glass available but the X-Series lenses are great they really are even the kit lens I mean that's what's on here now the 18 to 55 it's an absolutely epic lens it really is it's dirt cheap as well but I mean when you get into the more high-end professional lenses like the 50 to 140 I mean that is an exceptional lens my go-to lens for you know portraits long range shots at weddings and also a whole heap of different landscape photography shots so yeah having having you know good quality lenses is essential obviously if you want to get good photographs and as, as well you can adapt full frame glass to this i've got a number of full frame lenses that i adapt, adapt to the fuji system obviously that means you can't use the autofocus you've got to manually focus but for landscape photography and you know other aspects of photography you, you know manually focusing is absolutely fine so so over the last three years i think i've learned really to not worry too much about the APS-C thing i don't see any loss of quality with an APS-C sensor so i really don't think it's anything to worry about at all depth of field is slightly different as is the focal length but you know once you get used to it it's a uh, plain sailing really it really is Anyway, I'm going to head down here and I'm hopefully going to take a couple of photographs and then I'll talk a little bit more about some of the negative sides of the X-T2. And there's not many, but there are a few. So I've got the X-T2 set up on the tripod here. You might just be able to see behind me there's a group of silver birch trees. So I'm going to take a shot of those. Just of the chunks, got this lovely white crispy bark on them. And we've got some side lighting right now. I've got the camera on the tripod mainly because I'm at 30th of a second and I'm zoomed in at 90 mil so hand holding this is not going to be ideal because I want to try and keep my ISO as low as possible. So yeah, these trees are really nice and what I've done is spent a little bit of time just making sure there's a separation between each chunk. I'm not getting too many chunks crossing over, I just want to try to keep it as minimal as possible and I'm not including any sky in this shot so I'm just cropping down just below the horizon level there and that's helping us just make a nice simple abstract shot and just behind you can just see the tree line and there's some haze and mist in the air and there's quite a bit of separation between the silver birch trees at the front and the trees at the background there so overall I think it's a good looking shot I, I like it. it looks great on the back of the camera anyway and uh, yeah nice little shot cloud is coming in now from the west and i think the sun's going to be dropping down behind the clouds anytime soon so i think the light's going to fade quite rapidly so uh, i'm going to grab this shot quickly and then uh, we'll carry on talking about the xt2 So when it comes to the X-T2, there, are, there is, really isn't that many negatives to be said. I guess maybe one thing that we're kind of moving towards now is cameras with higher resolution, so megapixels or a lot more. Probably the X-T2 falls behind most uh, sort of modern cameras now, like let's, let's take for example the Canon 5D Mark IV, it's around about 30 megapixels, I think the uh, EOS R is around about 30 megapixels. I think the D850 is around 45 megapixels. Uh, we've got the Z7, I think that's around 45 as well. And then you've got, you know, the new A7R4 or whatever it is, which is 60 megapixels plus. Um, you know, looking at the X-T2, you know, with its 24 megapixels, it, it seems lacking when you look at the actual numbers. But something to maybe consider is how many megapixels you actually need now for example if you're uploading to social media website maybe making a few prints 24 megapixels is probably going to do you more than enough really take this into consideration if you were to post an image on instagram um, you could crop into a fuji xt2 file five and a half times and still get the correct resolution so instagram file is 1080 pixels so the Fuji X-T files are 6,000 pixels wide, so you could crop into that five times, five and a half times, and you're going to be able to get a usable image. If you're not printing sort of massive billboard prints, you really don't need anything more than 24 megapixels. I think for commercial photography you do, you know, medium format cameras, that type of thing. But for everyday shooting, weddings, portraits, landscape photography, 
I personally think 24 megapixels is absolutely fine. I regularly print A2 prints, which are 24 inches uh, wide. So just for example, 24 inches is roughly from the end of my thumb to my armpit. So good length uh, in terms of the width of the print. I don't have any issues whatsoever with those prints that look absolutely mint, they really do. That being said, if you do decide to print larger, generally speaking, you're going to be standing further back anyway. So if you're printing A1 or A0 or something like that, you're not going to be standing, you know, three or four inches away from the print. You know, you're going to stand further away so you can see all of the print. So, you know, it's just a case of how many you actually need. Uh, obviously, with a larger resolution file, such as what the A7 IV is going to be, you know, 60 odd megapixels, you're talking about you know, images that are nearly three times the size. So you're talking about processing power as well for your PC on those raw files, especially when you're dealing with lots of images. Also storage as well, you know, it's almost three times the amount of storage you're going to need. So there's, you know, these numbers are not always, uh, you know, bonuses. There's, there's also a lot of negatives that you can take from them as well. No, I don't, don't get me wrong, I'm sure the, the, the new Sony files are going to be absolutely mint. But, you know, uh, just, just a case of how many you need for yourself. And for me personally, the 24, 26 megapixel file is absolutely brilliant. I don't have any issue with it at all. So in terms of megapixels, you know, it's a, it's a numbers thing. And I think camera manufacturers use these numbers to sell their cameras and you know it's not always something that you need to look at there are probably more important aspects of a camera to think about before how many megapixels it's got another great feature of the xt2 as well is the fact that it's got dual card slots so if you're thinking about shooting professional work then you know dual card slots are a must i can't imagine shooting um, somebody's wedding without having a backup uh, straight away it's just unthinkable for me and i know it doesn't happen very often cards don't fail that often but you know it's for peace of mind, really. Um, I always know, you know, if that day comes and a card fails, I've got a backup and it eliminates <laughs> so many different levels of stress. So I wouldn't be without it for that, for that reason, really. And another great thing about maybe if you're thinking about buying an XT2 is obviously you're in the used market now because they're not manufacturing them anymore. But you can pick up an X-T2 for around, a mint condition X-T2 for around about £500 here in the UK. I'll put that in dollars on the screen. And, you know, that is seriously good money for a quality camera. It really is. You know, 500 quid is going to get you a professional level quality camera that, you know, you'll be able to use. And if I was buying now and I didn't have, you know, an X-T3 or anything, I'd seriously consider getting an X-T2 spending my money on glass and then when the xt4 comes out thinking about part exchanging the xt2 for a brand new xt4 because i think the jump between the xt2 and the xt4 will be a lot bigger than between the xt2 and the xt3 i've got an xt3 if you're interested in the comparison between the xt3 and the xt2 i've done a video on that i'll leave that down in the description and I've also done a video on getting more megapixels from your camera as well, which I'll leave in the description as well. So if you think 24 megapixels isn't enough, there are a couple of techniques that you can actually use to increase the resolution of your files. So if, if that's of interest to you, I'll, like I said, I'll leave the links down below so you can go and check those videos out as well. But yeah, all in all, I think I'm so happy with uh, my setup for 2020, the 2XT2s and the X-T3. Anyway, guys, I don't think I'm going to be able to get another shot because the light is failing rapidly. It is uh, literally, you know, this time of year in the UK, four o'clock sunset. And, you know, when we've got a bank of cloud as well, you know, it's like 3.30 now and we're almost out of light. So I think I'm going to call it. I don't think I'm going to get another image today. But even so, I really enjoyed that Burt shot. And if you want to see more shots from me, you know, check out the vlog. We've got heaps of material on the channel. So please do consider subscribing, liking, sharing and all that good stuff, guys. OK, guys, I'll see you next week. Take care now. <laughs>